105 years ago, in the first week of November, one of the most drastic resolutions was passed that continues to impact the Ummah and has changed the course of global history. And every one of us should be aware of this. What am I referring to? I'm referring to the very unfortunate document known as the Balfour Declaration. The Balfour Declaration, we are commemorating, I shouldn't say commemorating, it is uh, quote-unquote the anniversary, but for us it's not a positive anniversary. It is this exact week, 105 years ago, November, first week of November in 1917, when this document was drafted and sent. And today, inshallah, I want to summarize what is this document and why should every one of us be aware of it and what are some of the lessons and the points that we can learn from this document. So what is this document? As we said, 105 years ago, this very day, this very week, 1917, the Balfour Declaration was issued. It is a letter written by the Foreign Secretary of England by the name of Lord Arthur Balfour. So it's called the Balfour Declaration because his name is Balfour. And he wrote it to somebody by the name of Lord Rothschild. We're going to discover who he is today. And in this letter, which was hand-delivered from the ministry to the house of this private citizen, again, the plot thickens, the government expresses its interest to create a national homeland for the Jewish people in the land of Palestine. This is what is known as the Balfour Declaration. And of course, from this declaration, this was the beginning of a series of events that culminated in the creation of the State of Israel. This is where it begins, 1917 November, right here. So how did this come about? Remember, at the turn of the century, less than 3% of Palestine was inhabited by Jewish people. 97% of this region was Muslim and Christian. The majority Muslim, and there was a healthy percentage of Christians from the time of the Crusade. Salah al-Din Ayyubi allowed the Christians to live there. And there were also some Jewish people, 3% local indigenous Arab Jews. They spoke Arabic as a language. They were Arab Jews living in peace and harmony. No problems in that region. So how could this letter come about that is saying in this 3% Jewish land, we're going to make it an entire Jewish land. This is what the Balfour Declaration is. And in order to understand this, we need to go back and contextualize what is happening. 1917, World War I is well underway. World War I has already begun three years ago. And the Allied forces are in deep war against the uh, uh, opposite side. And the Allied forces, of course, primarily England, is the superpower at the time. As you should all know, America was not yet a superpower. It was the United Kingdom. World War I and World War II would change and America becomes a superpower because England diminished, because World War I destroyed the massive kingdom and empire of the United Kingdom and then World War II created a vacuum and America rises up in that vacuum. World War I, America has not gotten involved. 1917 and America's neutral. America is not on the side of the Allies. So England is deep in quagmire and it is fighting battles across the region and especially in Muslim lands. And the Ottoman Empire has sided with the enemies of England and that is Germany. So the Ottoman Empire and the Germany, uh, uh, the Austro-Hungarian forces, uh, Wil Wilhelm um, uh, Kaiser, the, the, Kaiser, the Kaiser of Germany, is siding with the Ottomans and the British are on the other side. 1917 comes around and this letter is silently released, secretly released. What is the public backdrop? The public backdrop is England has promised the Arabs, England has promised the Sharif of Mecca that if you break away from the Ottoman Empire, we will give you a Khilafah all over again, an Arab Khilafah spanning from Baghdad all the way to Yemen. It will be yours. This is the public well-known promise. You all know you've heard of that famous spy that was sent to Arabia, what was his name? Who can say? Who knows the name of the spy? Lawrence of Arabia, right? This Lawrence of Arabia turns out to be a secret agent of the British, right? Lawrence of Arabia is sent to convince the Sharif of Mecca. Who is the Sharif of Mecca? The great great grandfather of the current king of Jordan. The Sharif of Mecca, he is, his family has been ruling Mecca for 800 years. 
And he is a direct descendant of the uh, Al Bayt. He's a uh, he's a Alawi. He's a descendant of Ali radiAllahu an. And he's been ruling, ruling Mecca for 800 years. Now the British, their tactic is divide and conquer. We all know this, right? So they say, who can be a counterweight to the Ottomans? The only person they can think of is the Sharif of Mecca. He has the lineage. He has Mecca. He has some prestige. So they say to him, if you publicly go against the Ottomans, break away. And you declare jihad against the Ottomans, we're going to give you this entire region, minus Constantinople, Istanbul, minus the Ottoman land, the Arab lands, the glorious Khilafah of the Abbasids, the Umayyads, shall return to you. And this was a public promise, everybody knew it. And so the Sharif broke away. And the Sharif declared war against the Ottomans. And the presumption or the assumption was, okay, now that I'm on your side, O oh England, now, when we win, when you guys win, I'm going to take over this entire region, which includes Bilad al-Sham. It includes Palestine. So, Mecca, Medina, Jerusalem will all be under this new Khilafah, the Sharif thinks. But the Sharif didn't realize the British play very vile games. The British have very cunning tactics. And unbeknownst to the Sharif of Mecca, the British already had a secret plot. This plot only comes to light afterwards. It is called the Sykes-Picot Agreement. The Sykes-Picot Agreement is a secret plot between Russia. Russia at the time was on the side of the Allied forces. You have to understand Russia, World War II switches. In World War I, it's on the side of England. Russia, England, and France, all three agree that once we win over the Ottoman Empire, we're going to carve the Middle East, and each one of us is going to get a share of the price. So... The Arabs have been lied to, and they didn't know this. Now, these two documents, one public, one private, now a third one private comes. Triple crossing. The British double-crossed the French and the Russians as well. Literally, this was their tactic. And they sent this secret document to Lord Rothschild, known as the Balfour Declaration. The question arises, why? What's going on? Why promise a Jewish homeland during World War I? What is the point behind this? That's what we're going to talk about for the next few minutes. You have to understand one thing. The notion of a Jewish homeland was something very recent. Believe it or not, barely 10, 15 years before World War I, this notion is now becoming popular in Europe. And the founder of this notion, Theodor Herzl, announces this in Switzerland in the, eight, 18, in the late 1890s. Literally, 10 years before World War I. 1890s, a conference is convened. It is called the Global you know, Zionist Confederation. And the notion of creating a Jewish state is launched. Unbelievably, the bulk of Jewish people in the world rejected it. It sounds weird to us, but I'm not making this up. Look it up. 99% of the Jewish people around the world shrugged their shoulders and didn't care. They literally said, what are you doing? We're comfortable. American Jewish people in particular did not sign up to the Zionist program. Only a few very secular-minded politicians and wealthy people of Europe, they had this notion. They tried to lobby and it fell flat. Nothing happened. Herzl dies, and the second in charge, his name is Chaim Wiseman. Chaim Wiseman takes charge. Chaim Wiseman is a chemist. He moves to England. He becomes a professor of chemistry in Manchester. And he patents certain uh, products. Long story short, uh, is it the production of acetone, I think it is, which is needed in bombs. And so World War I happens. His uh, patents become popular, he becomes multi-billionaire. He becomes filthy rich because he has invented a procedure to invent bombs, basically, making it simplistic. So he becomes extremely wealthy. With that wealth, he develops ties with the British government. Wealth changes everything. Wealth changes everything. And he becomes friends with the prime minister at the time. Who was the prime minister? In 1905, Lord Balfour was the prime minister. A lot of people don't know this. The one who's going to become the foreign secretary in 1917, 10 years before this, he's actually the prime minister of England. A lot of people don't know this, right? He was prime minister for two and a half years. Then he resigned and he remained a minister. He resigned from being a prime minister. He remained a minister and then he became foreign secretary. But he was prime minister. When he was prime minister, this guy, Chaim Wiseman, becomes friends with him. 
pitches to him the idea of Zionism, and Lord Balfour signs on. He becomes a Christian Zionist, one of the first of Christian Zionists. But it's 1905. Nothing can happen. He likes the idea, but he doesn't do anything. World War I happens, and now the opportunity presents itself. So Wiseman goes to Balfour and says, hey, if you promise a homeland, this is going to aid you guys in World War I. It will help you guys in your efforts in this great war. And so Lord Balfour decides to start the engineering behind the scenes. And he goes to the war cabinet and he then issues this Balfour Declaration. What is especially important for us to make note of, this was not debated in British Parliament. The Parliament did not come together and talk about the Balfour Declaration. Why? Because it was a time of war. And during times of war, what happens? The government seizes power. Even after 9-11, what happened? Bush said, executive authority, give me all your power. That's what happens. People panic in war. In war, people forget about democracy. In war, people forget about voting and whatnot. They just want to get things done. So because it was war, this issue was not debated in parliament. Rather, a small group of ministers on the aptly called war committee. The war committee, five people. And amongst them is Lord Balfour. Again, Balfour used to be prime minister. Even though he's now the foreign secretary, his power is a lot. Imagine he used to be prime minister. Imagine his connections. Imagine his clout. So Lord Balfour makes sure this war cabinet issues this agenda, this Balfour Declaration. The British government, the British secretariat did not debate this issue. It was not put up to a vote. It was done by the war committee because it was 1917, a time of war. Now, why send it to this person called Rothschild, who is a private citizen to get this memoir from the government? Isn't it strange that the government is releasing a document and sending it to a private citizen to tell them, hey, Mr. Private Citizen, we're going to create, you know, a land for the Jewish people. Well, who is this Rothschild? The Rothschild family, the Rothschild family, and again, it's difficult to talk about this because automatically, whenever you say these types of things, people say, oh, you're being anti-Semitic or something. No, this is not anti-Semitic. This is a factual statement. The Rothschild family is the richest family in human existence right now, and it has been for the last 200 years. The Rothschild family is worth half a trillion dollars. I repeat, half a trillion dollars. It is a elite dynasty. Now, here's where the conspiracy theories come. I'm not saying they're a cabal. I'm not saying they're Illuminati. It's a factual statement. They're an extremely wealthy family that date back to the 1700s. Their ancestors, uh, they are Jewish Europeans. Their ancestors were of the first people to open up an investment bank. And they have their branches in Switzerland, in England, in every European country. And to this day, the Rothschild family is well known. Go Google it. Read up their Wikipedia page. It's not a conspiracy theory. The Rothschilds are the most wealthy family in the world. Why haven't many of you heard of them? Because they're also extremely politically savvy and they stay out of the news. They don't get involved in actual politics. They don't run for office, by the way. They have the wealth. They don't need to run for office, right? They're, you don't hear about them because they keep out of the news. But go Google them and find out their investment. They are well known. So this Rothschild that he sent this letter to was the informal, most prestigious Jewish British citizen, the one who was admired by the Jewish people of England, and he was also the president of the Jewish Zionist Federation. That's why he was sent the letter. That the letter is being sent to him that we are now going to look favorably upon the creation of a place for the Jewish people in Palestine. Now, of interest here is that the Balfour Declaration intentionally used very ambiguous language. I quote you from the document, from the declaration. The original declaration, you can still see it in the museum. You can actually find it on the Wikipedia page. The actual original type document, it is still there. The, the document says, and I quote from it, that the British government, listen to this, views with favor the establishment of a national home for Jewish people, end quote. Look at the language. Views with favor. It's not legal language here. It's an emotion. It's not legal language. 
the UK, the British government views with favor. What type of legal language is this? Also, look at what they say. That national home, not national state. Why? Why did they have this ambiguous language? Historians point out, they knew that this document would cause a backlash from the parliament. They knew that if they're going to say to the world that we're going to create a Jewish nation, a state, it's going to cause problems. So they didn't say, the Balfour Declaration does not state that England is going to establish a country. No, look at it. Views with favor, national home, purposely ambiguous, right? Now, the intention was a state. But the language does not state that. You understand what I'm saying here, right? The intention, you're going to carve out a country. But the language is very vague. And it was done on purpose. Also, in the document, it says that uh, it, it explicitly states that uh, the local population of non-Jews, their rights must not be trespassed against. They say non-Jews. They don't say Muslims and Arabs. 95% of the people are Muslim. It says the non-Jewish population. So as again, not to bring in explicitly that the majority are going to be uh, Muslim over there. Now the question arises, and this is the big question. Why? Why would England promise? Why would the UK promise the Zionist lobby that they're going to create a land in Palestine? What is United Kingdom gaining out of this. I'm going to be very academic here and tell you, frankly, nobody knows. The theories are many. I'll give you some of them. Because it boggles the mind. Why would England, in 1917, want to promise 1% of the Jewish population? Because remember, 99% of the Jewish people were not interested in a state right now. Remember, Nazi Germany still hasn't happened. Hitler hasn't even come to power. He's not even known. This is 1917. American Jews and European Jews have no interest in leaving their lands. They're living comfortably. Why would we go somewhere else, risk our lives? The people aren't going to like us. It wasn't popular. So why would the English government, the British government, adopt this plan? There are so many theories. Frankly, nobody knows for certain. What is this? Of these theories is that they felt, that the British government felt that they would get the global support of the Jewish diaspora and that the American Jews, the British Jews would then support the efforts of World War I and people uh, like Chaim Wiseman, who was very wealthy, like Lord Rothschild, who was a multi-billionaire, that their finances and their patents would help World War I. That is a theory. And, you know, it, it makes sense. At the same time, one could point out that these are few individuals and the bulk of world Jewish people are not interested in Zionism. So one can say that this didn't seem like a wise move. Others have pointed out that during this time frame, if you know your history, the czars of Russia were overthrown, the Bolsheviks come to power. And many of the key Bolsheviks were actually of a Jewish background. So another theory, England wanted to appease the Russians by this. They're worried about this new power. They're not sure, will the Bolsheviks side with them or against them? So this is a theory. Allah knows best. A third theory is that they wanted to appease to the German Jews. So we have the American Jews, the British Jews, the German Jews, the Russian Jews. The German Jews under uh, Wilhelm III, Kaiser Wilhelm III. So at this time, remember, there is no Nazi party in Germany. This is 1917. German Jewish people, by and large, are living comfortable lives. So their support is for the Kaiser, which is the German side. They feel, maybe the British feel, if we give them Palestine, they might support us. All of these are theories. I'm going to conclude with the fourth one, which probably makes the most sense. In the end of the day, to this day, historians are scratching their heads. Why would England do this, right? I'm going to conclude with the, the fourth one, and that is... They're not actually making an appeal to the World Jewish Federations at all. Actually, their appeal is to Christians. And to Christians who sympathize with Zionism. And in particular, to this country that we're living in right here. Because America had not yet entered the war. And Christian Zionism, what is Christian Zionism? 
Christian Zionism is what exactly what it is. These are people of a Christian background who for religious reasons want the creation of Israel because they think it's going to expedite the coming of Jesus Christ, right? And this movement was now spreading in America. So a fourth theory is that this Balfour Declaration is actually meant to tip the scales of Christians here in America. And the administration here was and still is full of Christian Zionists, as you're aware. Trump appeals to them all the time. You remember he moved the capital to Jerusalem. Why did he do this? For the Christian Zionist base, right? So the notion, therefore, the Balfour Declaration was meant to persuade America to enter the war and to side with the UK against the German forces. This might have more sense because Otherwise, the other previous theories don't really make any sense. You can also add, without a doubt, racism played a factor here. What do I mean by this? The anti-Arab and the anti-Muslim sentiment of the British people, right? The anti-Arab and the anti-Muslim sentiment of the British people that we don't care about them, we care more about people of our background and ethnicity, even though, by the way, there was a lot of anti-Semitism. But between anti-Semitism and anti-Muslim, they will prefer, you know, the Semites over the Arabs, even though Arabs are Semites. But you get my point here, right? They hate both, but they hate one less than the other. And because of this, they're going to side with the Zionist population over the Arab population. To um, conclude all of this, ironically, whatever the motivations of England, none of them were fulfilled. There was no support from the German Jews, the, the European Jews, the American, even they did not join the war because of the Balfour Declaration. The Americans joined for another reason because of the Lusitana being sunk and whatnot. That was a whole different reason altogether. So the British did not gain anything by the Balfour Declaration. On the contrary, it created a set of problems that we are dealing with to this day. Because of the Balfour Declaration, more and more people were allowed to immigrate to Palestine. And they were immigrating so fast that even England had to stop the quota and say no more immigration. And when England said no more immigration, the Jewish people of Palestine became terrorists, well known, and they started killing British soldiers. And they engineered a very massive bombing in the King David Hotel, infamous bombing, over 100 people were killed. Many, most of them were British. Uh, and uh, the, the person who led this bombing, Menachem Begin, eventually becomes the Prime Minister of Israel. Irony, the irony of ironies, right? So the Jewish people, or the, I should say the Zionist people, start fighting the British. The British decide to leave, and they hand over Palestine to the League of Nations and say, we have nothing to do with it, you guys decide. And the League of Nations in 1947, 1948, they vote and they say, khalas, we're going to create Israel. And because the Muslim world at the time and the Arab world did not have the type of political connections and the clout and the wherewithal to negotiate and to argue. They're still new to the world of global politics. They didn't have a statesman. They didn't have a land and a country. They didn't have representation. And the Zionist Federation did. The League of Nations voted in the state of Israel and the rest, as they say, is history. Now, I have been saying for many weeks and months and years over here how negative politics is and that doesn't change it's not for righteous people good people frankly are corrupted by politics still the world needs politics whether i don't like it or not politics is needed people have to run the country people have to run the world and politicians accomplish what clerics and philosophers do not accomplish because chaim wiseman was lobbying persistently because the idea was planted in Balfour's head, because they had the clout and the wherewithal and the money, because they had the influence. These political activists managed to get the Balfour Declaration passed. And because the Balfour Declaration was passed, the rest, as they say, is history. Politicians are not people, generally speaking, that have good piety and taqwa, but those that are good amongst them accomplish much good, and those that are evil accomplish much evil. Bottom line, even if we are not involved directly in politics, we have to be aware this is the world we live in. Influence does pay off. And if you look at the history of the creation of that country, it's all about connections and influence and politics. And it succeeded. It's not some cabal, it's not some Illuminati. It was lobbying, it was money, it was a strategy and plan, and it paid off. Some people amongst us 
have to do the same if we wish to accomplish something positive. May Allah give them barakah and khair and good. I personally don't want to be in that camp, but we have to have good politicians. May Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala bless all of us and ease the pain of our brothers in Palestine. Wassalamu alaikum wa rahmatullahi wa barakatuh. فيا ذلي ويا خجلي إذا ما قال لي ربي أما استحييته تعصيني ولا تخشى من العتب وتخفي الذنب عن خلقي وتأبى في الهوى قربي فتب مما جنيت عسى تعود إلى 